Uh, thank you everyone uh, for joining us and uh, thank you particularly to uh, Dr. Jamie Hoffman um, who's joining us this morning. Uh, uh, Dr. Hoffman is a graduate of the Albert Einstein College of Medicine, uh, did his uh, medical training at uh, NYU and then his hematology oncology training at Sloan Kettering. Um, Following that, he spent a few years down here at the Cleveland Clinic and has been an assistant professor of medicine uh, here at the University of Miami since 2013. He uh, has um, many areas of expertise, uh, but one of them is in amyloidosis. Uh, it's really impressive. He has a number of uh, publications um, in this area, including a recent one in the uh, Journal of American College of Cardiology. Um, He's really a, uh, a fantastic uh, clinician and uh, researcher in this area. And uh, we're really delighted to be able to have one of our uh, own faculty uh, talk to us about this uh, new and emerging area. So Jamie, thank you for joining us, all yours. All right, uh, thank you very much, Dr. Goldberger, for inviting me. <clears throat> I think every person that goes through internal medicine residency training, at least a little part of them wants to be a cardiologist. So. For me to get to give cardiology grand rounds, I appreciate the invite. So what we're gonna focus on today is cardiac amyloidosis. As a non-cardiologist, I'm gonna do my best to touch on some of the issues that are very pertinent to cardiologists. Uh, but again, I come from a hematology uh, vantage point. Uh, we're gonna focus on getting the diagnosis right um, and some of the uh, prognostic considerations and some treatment considerations. So an outline for the talk will be, we're gonna review what amyloidosis is and it's very confusing for a lot of people because it's really a basket of, of, uh, of related illnesses. We're going to focus, obviously, on the cardiac presentation, when to consider it, how to evaluate it. I'm going to spend a little bit of time on accurate typing. This has been a, historically a really important issue in amyloid. It's very easy uh, to misdiagnose people, and the treatment approaches between the subtypes are very, very different. <clears throat> it used to be that ATTR was kind of an afterthought <clears throat> because we didn't have much to do for it. And that's very much changed over the last year. So we're going to spend some time talking about ATTR. I'm going to do some of this uh, via case presentations. Uh, I'm gonna, we're going to go through several cases, a couple prominently, that I think will illustrate some of the key points. Uh, we're going to focus on the two main subtypes, ATTR and AL. I will touch on some of the hematologic considerations, but again, try to keep this very cardiology focused. Again, we'll deal with how we handle cardiac involvement and some of the prognostic uh, markers. And then uh, we'll spend a little bit of time talking about what's changed over the last two or three years and so what's changing uh, going forward. So when you're talking to a broad audience, it's, it's important to, to tell uh, internists when they should consider amyloidosis. So obviously for the group that's listening here, the key is when you see this quote unquote hypertrophy that's not real hypertrophy without a history of hypertension, and of course, we talk about um, uh, hypertrophy as listed on the uh, echo, and then low voltage as opposed to elevated voltage on the EKG. Uh, another, uh, another thing that you see in terms of presentation is people that have heart failure, typically diastolic heart failure, but with significant orthostatic hypotension, presyncope and syncope. A classic story is a cardiologist will start some of the typical meds like ACE inhibitors, and then patients are lightheaded and passing out and they come to clinic with systolics in the 80s. They don't tolerate much outside of diuretics for some of those patients. Anybody who comes to one of our clinics uh, because they're being followed for an MGUS and ends up in a cardiology clinic for heart failure, I think these are our cohorts that are enriched for amyloid and that we need to consider them strongly. Outside of cardiology, of course, we have nephrotic syndrome. We have some tongue changes that we're going to talk about. Uh, carpal tunnel is a really actually a, a, a critical clinical variable, especially in ATTR. I sometimes joke with the fellows or the students that I'm with when I'm seeing a patient who clearly has ATTR that you can walk into the room and say, so have you ever had problems with carpal tunnel? And the patients open their eyes wide and say, of course, uh, seven years ago we had bilateral release. Uh, it, typically in ATTR, it's seven to 10 years preceding the diagnosis and in AL, it's around a year. And then uh, people can have neuropathies, autonomic peripheral, coagulopathies. It's one of the few causes in hematology of factor 10 deficiency, which causes PT and PTT prolongation. 
and then soft tissue involvement with periorbital uh, ecchymoses. So these are pictures uh, from, my, from, my, from my phone uh, all across the clinics of UM. And we've recently published a bit on some of these pictures because there's a spectrum of tongue changes in amyloid. From the top left, you see very subtle ridging of the tongue. Uh, you can see the teeth leave an imprint on the tongue because in these cases, the tongue is not all muscle, it's muscle with this infiltrative waxy protein. And some of the cases can get very obvious. Um, I, I don't know, I guess the pointer's probably not gonna work, but in the middle to the right, you see this woman that has some uh, ecchymoses on her lips, and you see real tongue uh, ridging where her teeth are imprinted. This was a woman I saw as a second opinion for myeloma, but on a physical exam, it was clear that she had more going on. They thought she had dyspnea from her myeloma treatment. Um, on the bottom left, that's the front and back of the same tongue, severe, on the bottom right, excuse me, severe glossomegaly with these kind of waxy, pearly plaques on the back end of the tongue. So a tongue evaluation is really important, certainly in the hematology clinic with MGUS, because you can pick up amyloid. And in the cardiology clinic, it's also valuable. I will tell you that from a physical exam perspective, it's the one finding that is subtype specific, meaning you only see uh, macroglossia uh, in, in the setting of AL. You don't see it in the setting of ATTR. So with that, I wanted to present a case that came to us through UMH. Uh, this is a 39-year-old African-American man, no past medical history, actually a very fit guy, track running, et cetera. Uh, despite being a well person, required, uh, he had AFib requiring ablation um, in the end of December, this is 2012. I uh, became more dyspneic, was told by a cardiologist that he had a, a cardiomyopathy, but didn't really have further assessment. Eventually got admitted through the ER to UMH with, with decompensated heart failure. Uh, he was on some of the classic uh, meds that you'd expect and on exam had some signs clearly of, of right-sided failure with, J, with jugular venous distension. He had edema. He did have some uh, bibasilar crackles. Labs were, were okay from a routine perspective, but had some proteinuria and a high NTBMP. Uh, our cardiology group uh, performed an echocardiogram, and I hate trying to interpret these pictures, although I have a general idea to a cardiology audience, but I don't think this is subtle. They're severe L LVH. Uh, the septum was measured at 1.8 centimeters, which in the setting of AL, that's very, very severe. In ATTR, that's very typical. Um, so, you know, you look at the uh, septum and you can start to make some guesses based on the diagnosis. Uh, unusually, he already had a low ejection fraction, which usually happens very late in both forms of amyloid and had this kind of bright appearance to the walls of the, of the, uh, uh, of the heart. Um, uh, as opposed to the quote-unquote hypertrophy, you see here that the EKG showed low voltage, so that gives you some pause whether that's true muscular hypertrophy. And a cardiac MRI showed some subendocardial gadolinium enhancement, which, would, which was read by a radiology group as very typical of, uh, of, of amyloid. He went on to a cardiac biopsy. You see the H&E stain and a silver stain that both that showed uh, this amorphous pink material. There's no Congo red stain here. And then you see the silver stain showing the amyloid kind of interdispersing between the myocytes. So, so we had a diagnosis here, right? He presented uh, without risk factors with what appeared to be with, with very thick heart with low voltage, no history of hypertension, uh, highly suspected amyloid by echo and EKG, highly suspected by MRI. These days, we don't need to biopsy all these patients, but uh, certainly from a subtyping perspective, it can help. And we're going to get into that a little bit more. And so we had a diagnosis. We had this young fellow with severe cardiac amyloidosis. But that's only part of the puzzle because, as I mentioned at the start, amyloid is a basket of multiple different diseases. Some of them are treated with chemotherapies and some are, are, would be a big mistake to try chemotherapies. So, so we had a diagnosis of a protein deposition disorder, but we did not really have an etiology. There are at least two dozen types of amyloid, but we can kind of narrow them down to some key categories. When we talk about amyloid, uh, usually the way it's referenced is when you have AL or ATTR, the initial A stands for amyloid, and the letters that follow tell you about the precursor protein. So AL is amyloid from light chains or antibody fragments. ATTR is amyloid from transthyretin. And we're going to spend time really focusing on those two. There are more rare genetic subtypes, as I list below ATTR. And then certain, certainly AA or secondary amyloid is a lecture in and of itself. But I pull that out of this talk uh, primarily because it's very unusual in the United States. And secondarily, it almost always presents with severe nephrotic syndrome, 
with cardiac involvement to be very uncommon. So the classic cardiac amyloid differential is AL versus ATTR. The challenge is we have these different uh, uh, precursor proteins that can form amyloid, but our standard pathologic evaluation cannot reliably differentiate the subtype. And I put this in red because this is a source of a lot of, uh, of misdiagnosis and confusion because many, many well-meaning pathologists will say, will do kind of standard immunohistochemical stains and say things like stains more for TTR or stains more for lambda or kappa light chains. These may be slightly suggestive, but I could, I could give you a dozen cases where this led people in the wrong direction. So the Congo red positive apple green bivirifringens, this is seen in every single subtype of amyloid. Um, and so it does not give you this precise diagnosis. When we talk about the systemic amyloidoses, again, I highlight AL and ATTR. In AL, the precursor are kappa or lambda light chains, more commonly lambda, and in ATTR, it can be either mutant transthyretin or wild-type transthyretin. And we'll talk more about this, but around 3.5% of African Americans in this country, African Americans in this country carry a autosomal dominant gene for ATTR. So that's the diagnosis we see classic age in the 60s, whereas the senile systemic or wild type ATTR is a disease more commonly seen above 70 and really most commonly above 80 with a male, with male dominance. And you see in terms of clinical presentations, the problem is there's a lot of overlap. Uh, AL is the only one that causes tongue changes, some of these soft tissue changes, so to speak. But AL, ATTR with mutant, with mutant or wild type uh, TTR both cause or all cause cardiac. Uh, so again, the clinical presentation separate from the tongue findings don't lead us in, any, in one direction or another. So, so why does it matter? Why does it matter to all of us if, if we make a diagnosis of AL versus ATTR? And even with an ATTR, uh, wild type versus hereditary. So there's many, many reasons. This was just the database that a long time ago I participated in that's been built up quite a bit since then. And it's one of many, many, many data sets that show that AL has a work, worse prognosis than, AT, than ATTR. And if you break it out further, it's not evidenced really by this chart, but wild type ATTR is a more benign illness than, than hereditary. So for the first uh, reason we want to know is because there's a different prognosis. But a much more critical reason is the treatments are fundamentally different. Someone has AL, we give them chemotherapy against the plasma cells that are producing the clonal antibody, those bad light chains. Whereas if they have ATTR, historically we talked a lot about liver transplant and, more, and in the more modern times we talked about TTR stabilizers. And if they have mutant ATTR, then you have a family at great risk because of this autosomal, uh, autosomal dominance. And I'll make the point here that I already mentioned that mutant TTR is, is common in the African Americans uh, uh, population. And we know that MGUSs are, pop, uh, are common in the same exact population. So you have a group of patients that can have TTR mutations, one out of 33, and can have monoclonal gammopathies. And at, you know, above age 60 or 65, it can be 3% as well. So if you have a TTR mutation and you happen to have a monoclonal gammopathy, you could have ATTR, you could have AL with a, with a, with a, um, with a coincidental mutation. So in, in such cases, uh, pathologic typing becomes critical. So how do we type people for sure, for sure? How do we know if it's AL or ATTR when it's the same Congo red material, it's the same apple green bivirifringens, um, and we can't tell with standard pathology? So there are thankfully several ways. One of them is called pathologic typing, where you actually get the biopsy and you can evaluate it in interesting ways to get your type. One of these ways is called immunogold electron microscopy, which is a somewhat experimental, not really commercially available, but very well validated approach where you use antibodies with gold beads attached to their tail to kappa, lambda, and TTR. You wash the, uh, the uh, biopsy specimen uh, with each of these. Uh, you, 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 uh, you incubate them with each of these, then you wash them. And the one that stays at the end uh, is, is uh, the one where the antibody can actually bind. And then you know that those are the, that's the precursor protein. So this was a case that we presented that had a monoclonal gammopathy and a TTR mutation. And you can see that it's clear that the amyloid fibrils themselves or TTR in origin. The far more common approach, because it's commercially available, is by mass spec, 
And this has been validated many times over. They laser micro dissect out the amyloid. They run it through a mass spec machine. And you ultimately get a printout that says this amyloid is made up of kappa light chains, lambda light chains, or TTR fragments. And within TTR, it can even tell you if there's an amino acid substitution typical of mutated TTR. So you really get a really nice printout. This is done through Mayo Clinic. We have an SOP in our pathology department for all cardiac biopsies. Uh, that, that will get sent to Mayo, and you get a really nice printout around two, two weeks later. And this is the gold standard for typing for cases where the typing is ambiguous. Now, many of you might be familiar, but using PYP spec, we now have a, a, a radiologic mechanism uh, to make the diagnosis of ATTR and to even type it as ATTR without needing a biopsy. So this is something that's been shown clearly uh, in multiple uh, um, uh, aspects of the literature. I'll talk about some. You see a case here uh, where you see a positive uh, PYP spec from uh, in the heart with uptake uh, uh, showing ATTR and another patient who had known AL amyloid, it's negative. So this tracer is preferentially picked up in TTR fibrils. So in cases that are clinically appropriate for such testing, uh, the PYP spec is considered diagnostic. In our current ATTR study that I'll mention to you guys a little later, you don't have to do anything other than a PYP spec to make the diagnosis and know that the subtyping is correct. So this is a huge advance and is one of the many reasons we're seeing a surge in these diagnoses. Now this is a perilous um, uh, technique uh, because it requires a little consideration before applying it. This was the article Dr. Goldberger mentioned that uh, recently was in Jack that we got to participate in here looking at how we use PYP spec. And part of the article, this was written more by the cardiologists amongst us, was focused on uh, some of the, the uh, potential uh, pitfalls of using the PYP spec. One of them is that there are cases of AL that will pick up uh, uh, the, the tracer and, and show up as positive. Another one is the blood pool can sometimes be difficult if you don't use the spec portion of the test, if you simply look at the planar uh, imaging. And then finally, on the bottom, you see a case where uh, it was a negative PYP spec, it was clinical suspicion, and ultimately a biopsy showed that it was ATTR, and it was ATTR with an uncommon mutation. So not every mutated form of, of, of mutant ATTR picks up very well in the PYP spec. So you can have false positives and false negatives, and you see in the middle, if you have the typical heart failure uh, on echo or MRI, if you have zero monoclonal gammopathy, so you have no monoclonal proteins and a positive PYP spec, this is a patient that makes a diagnosis of ATTR cardiomyopathy, and then you just have to subtype to see if it's mutant or wild type with, with a TTR mutational analysis, which by the way, we can do for free on any of your patients. We have kits in our clinics. So this was the algorithm that we proposed at the end of this article uh, in terms of how to incorporate PYP spec. And if you follow it, a critical step is, so first, obviously, there's pretest probability. So you guys, you guys look, you think this person may have amyloid. We then run the serum and urine monoclonal gammopathy panel. And this is absolutely critical because if there is a monoclonal protein by blood or by urine, the PYP spec is no longer good enough for typing. It is only good enough in a case where those tests are negative. So when you, when you in the cardiology clinic want to make this work up, you send this panel and we're happy to give advice on the panel. If it's positive, then we get to collaborate together because then those are more complicated analyses. They require uh, pathology. Ultimately, you have to confirm with pathologic typing and we need to rule out uh, clinically significant uh, plasma cell dyscrasias. And remember, as you go down that road, you can have ATTR with a monoclonal gammopathy. You can have uh, AL, with a TTR mutation. So all of these things are possible. Um, and ultimately, if you do have no monoclonal protein and you have a positive test, you've made a diagnosis of ATTR and all that's left is sequencing and this has a, a pertinence to family members, again, as an autosomal dominant uh, uh, mutation. So with that, I wanna talk a little bit uh, about ATTR uh, itself. So TTR transthyroidin is produced primarily in the liver, a little bit in the choroid plexus. There are many, many different mutations, although there's a common African-American mutation and there are common neuropathy mutations in Europe. What ends up happening is it's a four-armed protein, a tetramer, uh, who, that exists in our body in the tetrameric form and in the monomeric form. In the monomeric form, it can form the, it can misfold and form amyloid fibrils. 
So if you have a mutation, it pushes the kinetics of this equilibrium in favor of the monomeric form. Uh, and that's why you see it at an earlier age. Uh, and ultimately, one of the approaches that's been proven to work is by stabilizing the TTR in the, in the, in the tetrameric state, you don't allow the monomers to be free floating and you stop amyloid deposition. And we're gonna talk about tefamidus in that regard. So again, here's a pictorial representation of the, uh, of the uh, tetramer, in this case, showing that it can be stabilized with the, with the tefamidus molecules or non-stabilized. Uh, then you have the misfolded monomers, and ultimately you have these um, uh, amyloid precursors, and then finally these beta-pleated sheets that form amyloid. And we think about ATTR, especially uh, hereditary ATTR, as, as, as there's a, a chance early in the course of the disease to really make a big difference, as opposed to if it's diagnosed very, very late, where people are on oxygen with poor performance status, um, that even if you stop new amyloid deposition, uh, the prognosis is going to be poor. So a major highlight of, of, of my talk, and we'll touch base a little bit at the very end of this, is how do we all make these diagnoses earlier, especially in an era where we have TTR-based uh, therapies. So this slide's a little bit redundant, but again, the precursor is the normal TTR or a mutant TTR. And uh, the manifestations of TTR hereditary are somewhat dependent on what gene you have. So in the African-American variant in the US, it's cardiomyopathy exclusive. In some of the uh, uh, variants in Sweden um, and in Ireland, uh, they relate to neuropathy almost exclusively called familial amyloid polyneuropathy. And then there are some that fall in between with multi-organ system involvement. So what do we do for ATTR patients? So obviously there's a supportive measure component to this and how cardiologists manage uh, uh, cardiac amyloid, it's tricky, it's not the same as classic heart failure from hypertension, et cetera. Again, it's hard to give that lecture to cardiologists, but I'll touch base on a couple of things that have at least been uh, validated. It's primarily with diuretics. Certainly for very ill younger patients, uh, cardiac transplants have been done. We recently did one on one of my patients with AL. Uh, historically, uh, uh, but they can be done with ATTR. Historically, we strongly considered liver transplantation for hereditary variants. The idea being that the mutant TTR is born in the liver, so if you get a new liver, then you are not gonna make mutant TTR. There's, uh, and and the, the transplanters absolutely love these patients because these were very healthy liver patients. So they did what were called domino transplants, where the, the liver that the, this patient received, their liver would then go to a cirrhotic. And that cirrhotic at age 55 is thrilled to take a very, very healthy liver with the idea that maybe in 50 years, he or she may have a little bit of amy you know, cardiac amyloid from mutant TTR. So, so they, they don't take from the system. They take one and they give one. But there are many problems with liver transplant, aside from the fact that it's a procedure with morbidity and requiring immune suppression. Uh, we learned that even wild type TTR can build on a scaffold of mutant TTR. And many of these patients had progressive disease even after liver transplant. So it's certainly far from a cure-all. So, so until recent years, we used things like doxycycline and TUDCA, which were amyloid stabilizers, never really validated in perfect studies, but, 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 but non-toxic approaches to trying to prevent amyloid formation. Diflunosol, which is an NSAID, has some reasonable data on the phase two setting. Uh, and this was used, although as an NSAID, it can cause NSAID-related toxicity. And then ultimately, we're going to focus on tefaminus, which was the first approved drug in the U.S. for ATTR cardiomyopathy, and we'll talk a little bit about patisseran and other RNA interference therapeutics, which are coming and will soon have approval for the same indication. So this was really the big article that came out in September of 2018 in New England Journal of Medicine on tefamidus as treatment for transthyroidin cardiomyopathy. We, had, we put 35 patients on this trial here at UM, uh, so we were active participants. And the metrics here showed without dwelling too much that tefamidus versus placebo improved overall survival. That's the primary uh, chart in the middle, the graph in the middle. It improved the six minute walk test, that's on the top left. And it also improved the rates of cardiac hospitalization. So these were real hard endpoints. Uh, and, and with this, it was a, it was a home run. The tefamidus got approved. The side effects approximated those of placebo. So it's really, really gentle. I do make the point when you look at the walk test, because this is something a lot of patients will, will, that you guys will see will talk to you about, People are excited to get on tefamidus because it's gentle and it's, it's approved and it's the first approved drug. But if you see the six minute walk test, even with tefamidus tend to get slightly worse with time. 
So tefaminus does help some people improve, it stabilizes many, and it slows the deterioration for some. So for a patient that's sick with this disease, advanced disease, sometimes there's some frustration with, hey doc, it's two months in and I don't feel better. Or, hey doc, how can you tell me if this is working or not? And much to Pfizer's benefit, there's no way to really tell a patient if it's working or not, so everyone just kind of stays on it. What we basically tell them is, we just know if there was 100 of you and 50 took it and 50 didn't, that the 50 that took it would do better. So people stay on this kind of chronically. The big problem with tefamine is the blowback really related to cost. And this was in the medical uh, literature. Some of these quotes from, come from Jack and AHA, and, and, and some come from uh, Bloomberg News, because this got into the lay press. And many of us, myself included, that were participants on the Tefamidus trial uh, uh, participated in some of this blowback. And you can see some of the issues. People talking about the price tag of $225,000 per year. Um, if you look at the bottom left, it talks about uh, uh, that the conventional cost effectiveness assessments were blown out of the water by this. Uh, you see a cost effective analysis showed that you'd have to reduce the price by 90% to get it cost effective at 100,000 per quality adjusted life years. And a big issue that Pfizer, I believe, um, kind of gamed the system a little bit is the pricing that they got was based on this being a rare disease. But what I'm sure they anticipated is with the tefamidus diagnosis, uh, with the tefamidus approval, excuse me, cardiologists were gonna become much more eager to make this diagnosis. You know, five, 10 years ago, a, a well-meaning cardiologist could have looked at an echo and a sick person with heart failure and said, you know what, this kind of looks like ATTR, uh, but what am I really going to do about it? Am I going to biopsy this fellow just to tell him that he's got a disease I can't really treat? Or let's just give him diuretics. But once we have PYP specs and once we have tefamidus, the diagnoses really surged and this was no longer a rare disease. And hopefully there's going to be some changes here in the approach to pricing of, of, of uh, tefamidus. Now, uh, this was kind of an overview on disease modi modifying therapies for, for amyloid. And I'm going to use this to kind of transition back to our case in a second. So you see that on the top left, you have TTR amyloid. In the top right, you have light chain amyloid. and the bottom, you have some supportive therapies. In the top right, this is where we talk, and we're going to get into this a little bit more, but this is where the hematologist will give chemotherapies and steroids and stem cell transplant to try to get rid of the plasma cells producing the abnormal antibody. So these are, this is the, a component of the care that the hematologists kind of own in partnership with the cardiologists. On the bottom, these are really heart failure related approaches that the cardiologists own. And we'll talk a little bit more about ICDs and some supportive based therapies. On the top left, this is kind of a mixed bag in terms of who owns this. In some centers, it's the hematologist. In some centers, it's the cardiologist. And I think in many cases, it's, it's shared. If you look at the TTR stabilizers, which I've circled, where you see tefamidus, Above that is another stabilizer called AG10. We have that trial open here at UM. Uh, and my biggest goal with that drug is to get a competitor on the market to tefaminus to force pricing uh, to be better. Although uh, in vitro, it is a more potent stabilizer uh, than tefaminus, and it seems to be just as gentle. The second circle goes around the TTR synthesis inhibition with patisseran and inotersin. These are two drugs that knock TTR levels down to zero. They're given by injection every three weeks, also expensive. They're only approved for neuropathy variants, not yet cardiomyopathy uh, uh, variants, but cardiologists should be aware of them because it's nearly certain that, that they're going to be approved for cardiomyopathy as well. So you're going to have tefaminus and you're going to have these, uh, uh, these two drugs, patisseran, I think, being the more gentle of the two. So I think we need bet more treatments for ATTR so that it forces some competition and some price reduction. So in our young person uh, that I started the case with, that 39-year-old, uh, that we had the Congo Red positive uh, uh, cardiac biopsy with the drop in EF, in his case, we really didn't need to subtype him for many reasons. He was really too young for either form of ATTR. When we look at his serum immunofixation, you see this good uh, dark band in the lambda region on the immunofixation. This was his immunofixation. And his free lambda light chain in the blood was you know, normals up to 26, his was 720, and he also had some tongue ridging. So he had the one physical exam finding that tells you this is AL. He had a bona fide rip roaring monoclonal gammopathy. He was too young for ATTR. So in this case, we made a diagnosis of AL. We did a bone marrow biopsy, which showed an increase in plasma cells. CD138 is a plasma cell marker. It showed these were exclusively lambda, i.e. clonal, 
it was in a, a classic fish uh, um, abnormality in these plasma cells. And this is a diagnosis of AL amyloidosis. So our young patient that we started with ultimately had AL. And so with that, I want to talk a little bit about AL and how we manage it. And again, I, I'm, I'm going to focus on the audience here being cardiologists. But AL is a clonal antibody-producing B-cell disorder. It's almost always a plasma cell disorder because plasma cells are the best antibody producers that we have, but can be associated with lymphomas. So the hematologist that you guys partner with will evaluate them, a bone marrow biopsy, find what are the bad cells producing the antibody, and target treatment towards those bad cells. Now, in terms of how do you know if someone has AL, the key step really is this monoclonal gammopathy evaluation. And I want to just make the point that if we simply order an SPEC, we will miss many, many cases. The serum and urine immunofixation adds sensitivity, but it's the serum-free light chain assay that is the single most important test. So if you see someone in the clinic, you look at their tongue, you think they might have AL, you want to make a referral. If you wanted to get the ball rolling or make the diagnosis yourself, that serum-free light chain assay is really, really the critical test for you to order because it's going to pick up almost all cases of gammopathy underlying these diseases. So what is AL amyloid in a single picture? It's right here. So you have the underlying clone, makes a bad light chain. The light chain aggregates initially in a prefibrillar form and ultimately in these classic amyloid fibrils. These fibrils then land in organs and cause problems. These prefibrillar aggregates themselves are cardiotoxic. If you inject them directly into a mouse, they have cardiac dysfunction, and that's without any amyloid in their heart. And this is one of the reasons why even very sick people with AL, when you treat them and the light chains normalize, they start to be more diuretic responsive and they look better despite the fact that their heart looks the same on the echo. So I tell our fellows that even very, very sick people with AL deserve a chance at some treatment because some of them rally very quickly, and I'll show you a case. So I'm going to go quickly through some of these slides, but the, a, the clinical features of amyloid general and AL certainly are somewhat nonspecific. We've talked about some of the different organ dysfunctions. People ultimately lose weight and are fatigued and become very sick. But when we evaluate the heart, there's a couple of points to make. So we talk about a um, mean uh, septal diameter or posterior wall diameter of 1.2 centimeters or greater absent other cause, meaning typically absent hypertension. Um, we consider some people, of course, for biopsy. By the time the ejection fraction is dropped, it's a very late event, uh, and we definitely use MRIs more and more. You can see here on an autopsy specimen how thick that, that, that left ventricle is, and you could even see this kind of waxy protein, even just with the naked eye. Uh, on, on the bottom right, this was a patient who went for cardiac transplant. You can see the pacer wire, and you can see this, again, this hyperemic, really, really thick heart. Uh, with, this is the EKG in that same presentation with low voltage. We stage our cardiac patients in AL with a, a Mayo cardiac stage, which basically checks three variables, uh, troponin, NTBNP, and the free light chains. Uh, and you can be staged from zero to four, basically, based on having none of these uh, or all three. Uh, and, and, that's, and you can see there's nice splay in prognosis there based on cardiac stage. Syncope is a very adverse prognostic finding. A New York Heart Association class is important. I have to assess that in all of our trials. And then those that respond to diuretics tend to be a better cohort than those that don't. The complications of AL depend on what organs are involved. We're focusing in this talk, of course, on the cardiac uh, problems. Patients that have cardiac amyloid, they either die of progressive heart failure or they die of arrhythmia. This was two examples, this was written by hematologists, interestingly enough, of patients with amyloid that had implantable uh, recorders and defibrillators who both developed shockable rhythms, the bottom one on screen here, I guess, and the top one was shocked off screen. But this, you know, this debate on who should get an ICD or not is still, uh, still out there. Many of these that die of arrhythmia die of PEA or uh, uh, they kind of vagal down to asystole. Um, and so they don't benefit from the ICD, but of course these patients did. And in an era where our patients are living longer and have more treatments for amyloid, I think things like ICDs are, are more reasonable to consider, although we don't have perfect evidence that they're a good idea. So Dr. Falk wrote a nice review, he's written several, on how we manage heart failure. Uh, and again, uh, with all respect, talking to a group of cardiologists, these are some general principles as I understand them. Uh, diuretics remain the mainstay of therapy. Um, 
when you give people uh, ACEs and ARBs, they tend to get really hypotensive. Same is true with beta blockers. Calcium channel blockers and digoxin tend to be somewhat contraindicated. And then there are many different approaches without perfect evidence to try to handle, to try to handle the arrhythmias. Uh, typically, because of the infiltration of this waxy protein throughout the electrical system, a simple ablation tends to be at least uh, not reliable, although it can be tried. Uh, amiodarone, dofetilide, et cetera. Uh, no clear OS survival advantage with the ICDs, although the, the, the studies have been very, very imperfect. And we often have to use midodrine to support the blood pressure to allow for diuresis. So many of our patients are on midodrine. When we're treating AL, the advances that we've made in myeloma have tangible benefit to our patients. And again, I'm only going to very briefly talk over this to a hematology audience. I would dive much deeper and I have more slides. But suffice it, suffice it to say, the prognosis in myeloma is around three times as good as it was 10 years ago. And all of these drugs in these varied classes have use in, in um, AL amyloidosis. We entered in 2015 the monoclonal antibody therapy with a drug called daratumumab. And this drug has made a huge difference in cardiac amyloid of the AL type because it's very gentle. It's not a chemical. It's an antibody. And there are multiple cases in our center of people really being saved with the inclusion of daratumumab. Um, daratumumab has become so valuable that it's even now been incorporated into upfront treatment. So this is a single picture that can kind of talk to you a little bit about AL amyloidosis treatment. It used to be that the treatment was with a very old chemo drug called melphalan, either given orally or by high dose therapy with stem cell transplant. When you did this treatment, and this was the way I did it in my fellowship, a third of patients would have a complete benefit in terms of their life chains, a third would have at least 50%, a third would get no benefit. A third, a third, a third. It was beaten into my head in the amyloid clinic. With advances, including proteasome inhibitors like bortezomib, we can now take 43% of patients and give them an excellent response, better than a partial response. This is called a very good partial response. So this article in 2012 on the top was showing that forget the melphalan era, if you go to bortezomib with cyclophosphamide, you can get far better hematologic remissions. And then on the bottom right, just, just recently presented, was adding daratumumab up front to the same regimen, the cytoxin bortezomib regimen. And in this case, 82% had at least 90% improvement in their, in their light chains, and this is typically associated with organ improvement. So even without a stem cell transplant, the vast majority of our patients with fairly gentle treatment, no hair loss, no throwing up, fully outpatient, can have their light chains controlled and improve their prognosis. This was a patient in UM who had been, this is for some reason UM uh, uh, graphs out their numbers right to left like Hebrew. So you, you see from right to left, this was a guy who I was trying everything. I was throwing the kitchen sink. These were his light chains, his free lambda light chains in graph. And then in 2015, daratumumab was approved, and I gave it to him, and he had a perfect remission. And this guy is alive and well. This chart ends in March of 2017, and he remains with very well-controlled disease. So he's a tangible example of someone who got the stem cell transplant, who got all the different drugs, and lasted just long enough to get, to get a real, a real uh, um, significant improvement in our, in our treatments and benefit from it. So when we're treating AL, we have, to, we have clinical principles we follow. We first follow the bad light chains. We give medicines and we watch the light chains get better. They can get better slowly, fast, they can relapse multiple times, but you gotta get the light chains better. When the light chains are better, then we can start to see organ improvement. On the top, this is a total protein. This goes from left to right. Uh, and in the brain nature of a peptide, it goes from left to right. So organ improvement happens out of phase from light chain improvement. Um, this is another one of our patients internally from right to left where you see the free lambda get better and the NTBMP get better. I'll make a brief mention that we were hopeful to be entering the era of amyloid resorbing agents with a monoclonal antibody called NEOD1. We participated in this trial at UM with standard chemotherapy. We added this agent with, you know, was with this or with placebo. This was an antibody to a cryptic epitope on the amyloid of the AL amyloid type to remove the amyloid from the body, meaning not just preventing amyloid, but actually removing it. And there was some really cool waterfall plots that showed in a phase two setting that it looks like there's organ improvement. But unfortunately, in April of 2018, even while the trial was ongoing, there was an announcement that on interval assessment, the drug was a failure and Prothena went out of business. So this was a real kick in the hopes of what we were uh, hoping to be a new era of amyloid resorptive therapy. That was a major disappointment in the amyloid community. 
Uh, I will make the point that um, I, I showed that other slide earlier. There is a new amyloid resorbing drug uh, on the market, came out of Columbia uh, called CAEL01. We thought about opening it here, but the NEOD1 experience was really kind of depressing for this type of approach. So I'm a little bit skeptical, but hopeful maybe this drug will be better. So let me run through a couple of quick cases here to try to drive home some of the points that we've been talking about. So this was a 58 year old woman with six months of failure to thrive, losing a lot of weight. She had very, a lot of difficulty swallowing, couldn't even swallow pills. She was highly anxious and she said that it was all anxiety, but it was clearly not all anxiety. She had a lower extremity edema and she had severe carpal tunnel. Her job was selling things on eBay and she blamed the computer for the carpal tunnel. But she had, this is the most she could uh, put her tongue out. Uh, and so she had a lot of tongue uh, enlargement. You can see the imprints where her teeth were making in her tongue. Um, this woman had very high lambda light change through the roof. So she had severe AL with an NTBNP of 15,000. She had high filling pressure, stage two diastolic dysfunction. This was a rectal biopsy proving her amyloid Congo red positive. She couldn't even swallow pills and she was diagnosed in the oral melphalan era. So we placed a peg to give her treatment and she died three days in, into treatment uh, less than a month after I met her. This was a marker of the problems with late diagnosis and that she didn't seek attention partially because of severe anxiety. This was a woman at Jackson. Um, you can see her tongue. This is not her sticking out her tongue. This is all she could do with her tongue. And she had a tongue biopsy. This case was initially written up by Matthew Salzberg, one of our fellows. Uh, she showed up at Jackson with a diagnosis from one of the islands of chronic angioedema of the tongue which I don't even think is a diagnosis. And what she really had was amyloid uh, with a thick septum, she was an older woman, and relatively low voltage. And she also did not make it out of the hospital. So if you wait around till the tongue looks like this, the prognosis is awful, especially in a world where the best we can hope to do is stop new amyloid deposition. So the final case, this is a really, really cool case. And if you can follow this case, you really know everything you ever needed to know about amyloid. So this was a 60 year old, Oh, is that a question or an unmuting? Okay, so there'll be questions. There'll be time for some questions at the end, or people can interrupt. So this is a 68 Caucasian man uh, with, who had five years of dyspnea. He was seen by six outside cardiologists, none of ours, six outside cardiologists. Uh, had an ablation, had developed severe dyspnea, started losing weight. Was told he had diastolic heart failure. He then saw one of our cardiologists. That cardiologist is very amyloid aware and sent off the light chains. And he called me excited, said, I, I made this diagnosis. It's confirmed. Look at that free lambda light chain. He suspected amyloid on her echo, on his echo, excuse me. And the upper limit of normal for the free lambda is 26. And here you have a 605. So you have the right clinical story. You have a very high free lambda light chain. And it looks like we have a diagnosis. This uh, doctor also sees patients at a different hospital. Patient had an endomyocardial biopsy. Uh, this was actually a Baptist. Um, and this was the diagnosis that he then uh, sent me. The Congo red stain is negative for amyloid. So he calls me again incredulous. He goes, how could it be? The echo is screaming amyloid. The light chains are through the roof. And now I have a negative gold standard test for, for amyloid. So I also couldn't believe it. And we had the biopsy specimen, specimen reviewed at uh, UM. And here it was very clear that there was Congo red positive material uh, and with apple green bivirfringence, you can see the bivirfringence here. And our patho so, so here's the first pitfall, right? You had, well, two pitfalls. You had six cardiologists see the patient, amyloid wasn't considered. Then you even consider amyloid and you have a pathology pitfall where the biopsy is read as negative because many pathologists don't see a lot of cases of amyloid. So we, uh, um, uh, our pathology group dove kind of deep investigating this case because it was a very interesting case. This was with a pathologist who's not here any longer. And she did immunofluorescence and she did standard immunohistochemistry staining. And I will tell you that the interesting part of this case was the patient's daughter was and remains a very well-educated person who read a lot. And when I spoke to her about this diagnosis, she said to me, well, how do I know my dad doesn't have ATTR? Um, or maybe even both. And, and she asked a very good question. She said, remember, my dad's been getting sick for five years. The literature tells me that AL patients get sick in a year or two, and then they're like, you know, life-threatening problems, but he's been getting sick for five years. So maybe this is ATTR. And I remember my initial conversation, I said, listen, it's possible. I appreciate anybody who's worried about misdiagnosis, but your, your dad has a free lambda light chain that is through the roof. 
He's not African American. He's kind of young for ATTR. It kind of, you know, I said it's 99.9% uh, uh, AL. So then we get this, the pathologist calls me internally and says, this is a really interesting case. By immunofluorescence, it stains very strongly that the amyloid is free lambda in origin, just like his blood work. But when you do a TTR, immunohistochemistry stain, it shows up positive as well. And she says to me, I think you have a case of both AL and ATTR. So I, I, that's very unusual, of course, right? So I call the patient's daughter sheepishly and explain that her question was actually a really, really good one. And now there's confusion because we have both subtypes. So we have to send it to Mayo for mass spec because our pathologists believe that, she, that, that he may have both subtypes. So we then send it to Mayo for mass spec and we get TTR mutational analysis. The mass spec on the top says that the, M, the mass spec detected a peptide profile consistent with AL lambda type and the patient himself had negative TTR mutation analysis. So we have another pitfall here. The mass spec tells us this amyloid is exclusively made up of lambda light chains. There's no TTR fibrils and this patient is way too young for wild type TTR and doesn't have a TTR mutation. So then I called her back and I said, lo and behold, first they said no one diagnosed it. Then they thought it was amyloid. Then the pathology said it's not amyloid. Then our pathology said it is amyloid. Then our pathology said it's two types of amyloid. Then the gold standard pathology tells us it's only one type. So this was a real roller coaster ride for me and for them. So this is the patient. Um, this is with permission on his 68th birthday, which is before treatment. He was wearing a birthday hat, but he admittedly did not feel well and was not a well person. This was his free lambda light chain before Cybor D, and this was his free lambda light chain after one cycle of Cybor D. It went down to totally normal. So one cycle of chemo, he got a few cycles in the end, put him into a hematologic remission. And at the time I met him and his daughter, they were both fixated on him being well enough to participate in her wedding, which was scheduled around six or eight months later. And you can see that, um, that his NTBMP started to come down, his weight started to improve, and this is him at her wedding that they sent me and allowed me to, and not only was he there, but he looked like a very uh, well person. And uh, there's even music behind this that adds a little something to it, but it doesn't play well here. So, so this was a guy who a had AL, was incredibly sick, but by the when we, and when we made the diagnosis, was really a late diagnosis, but, but with appropriate treatment and rapid light chain reduction, uh, he became well. And this, I think, heralds, uh, the, the reasons why we got to make these diagnoses, we got to make them right, and we got to make them early, um, uh, and we can really, really tangibly help people. And my final message as it relates to this, and again, I'm happy to answer questions, is that early diagnosis is key. We've had a difficult time getting patients for this study, but we do have a carpal tunnel screening program here at UM, um, and, and education is really the key. I, that's why I appreciate the opportunity to, to do this and other talks, because if you don't think about amyloid, you won't diagnose it. We need our hematologists, so the specialists need to be you know, need to be um, uh, thinking about this. We need to educate hematologists, because I've seen many people being followed for MGUS that get short of breath, and the you know, and their doctor just sends them to a cardiologist. Now you got a hematologist and a cardiologist, and no one ever speaks. Anybody with an MGUS that's developing dyspnea um, or orthostasis, you need to consider for amyloid. Uh, should we be screening people with carpal tunnel? It's an open question. Uh, could we launch a similar screening program in concert with our cardiology division looking for TTR mutations and free light chains, for example, in every patient with heart failure without a history of hypertension, as an example? These are very simple tests. It's a blood test for TTR mutation, and it's a simple blood test for free light chain assay. And of course, I'm open to collaborating with any and all of you in these types of things going forward. And that concludes the talk. I am sorry if I went a little bit quick, but I wanted to finish. I'm happy to take any questions. Jamie, uh, thank you so much. That was really a, uh, a wonderful overview and uh, at least for me, extremely uh, informative. Um, so I'll, I'll ask you one, uh, one quick question. Uh, I, I know the uh, indications for ICDs are, are somewhat uh, muddled by the fact that there's poor data, but who, who, in fact, do you consider to be a candidate for ICD uh, in 2020, and how does the uh, how does the treatment impact the uh, the indication? Yeah, so so I 
in, in these cases, of course, I appreciate my uh, collaboration with the cardiology group because there's several different variables where I commonly am asked to give an opinion is, is as it relates to prognosis. Because of course, you're going to place a, do a procedure and put an expensive device into someone you want to know that the prognosis is reasonable. Um, uh, and, and of course, you know, there are issues in terms of degree of heart failure that you guys are expert in, uh, uh, potentially, potentially the ability to provoke an SVT or other things. I know that, that there's some debate about some of these things in terms of who in general gets ICDs in the world of cardiomyopathy. But as it relates to amyloid in particular, a lot of it in my world hinges on prognosis. So in an era where light chain patients can really do well, even very sick ones, and in a world where we have gentle treatments for ATTR, um, the prognosis for many is actually pretty good and certainly more than a six month uh, window. So uh, I, I think myself and patients that are deemed uh, um, risky enough for shockable sudden cardiac death from your perspective um, that have a reasonable prognosis from my perspective, I think should be strongly considered for ICD. Uh, it has no bearing on how I treat them uh, after the fact, um, but, but uh, we have certainly anecdotally had, have had patients that have been shocked out of dangerous rhythms. You know, when we participated in a trial, a transplant trial, uh, and when I was at Sloan, we had a couple of cardiac, sudden cardiac events on monitor. And uh, in that trial, I, as I recall, there were four that were on monitor and none of them were shockable. And at that time, it just kind of fed into this idea that it's a severe vagal tone and PEA asystole as opposed to, to VT. But there are many, many anecdotes of benefit. And so to me, again, prognosis matches with what you guys think is their risk. I do think it's appropriate. Great. So we have a number of uh, questions here in the chat. So um, I don't know if you can see them, but it, uh, if not, I'll. So one question here is how specific is the finding of tongue swelling with teeth, teeth markings? Yeah. So there are, unfortunately, there are, and this is one of the banes of my existence, there is a normal variant called a scallop tongue where you can see some ridging on the tongue. I'm happy to distribute. We recently actually put together a, a review of soft tissue findings in amyloid. And within that, we really dive a little bit deeper into what are the real tongue findings. I would say this, clear macroglossia, okay? A tongue that's being bitten on the sides of the tongue where they protrudes out of the mouth, where you can see posterior swelling you know, in the neck. Uh, that in the right clinical setting is screams AL amyloidosis. Um, subtle tongue ridging, I've become very paranoid about that, and I've sometimes uh, thought someone was going to have amyloid, and they ultimately didn't. I've even done tongue biopsies on a few of these patients because I was so sure that the tongue was, 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 was amyloid, but I thought we were picking it up so subtly that we missed it on the fat pad. So, so I would say that, that it does take a little bit of experience to, to see the subtle findings, but some of the severe cases, um, you know, I sometimes will see it as the patient's talking to me you know, and think that this is not just an MGUS or something. Uh, so, and again, and I will tell you for sure, if you know they have amyloid, the tongue findings are 100% specific for AL. Never been a case of tongue involvement with ATTR. Okay, so here we, a uh, question about uh, research using uh, CRISPR-Cas9 to knock out TTR. Any, any research on that? Yeah, I, I, don't, I, I know I've read where this has been proposed. I'm not aware of anything that is a, a, in any way advanced. I think that it's an excellent question because it speaks to a whole new world of problems that you guys are going to confront and I already confront, which is the 66-year-old with diastolic heart failure and ATTR amyloid who has a positive TTR mutation, whose four kids get tested and three of them have a TTR mutation. This is not 100% penetrance, but it's high penetrance. Now you have three 40-year-olds with a TTR mutation and no cardiomyopathy. So what do we do? We typically, and the Pfizer would want you to give them all to feminists because it'll work really well early. But of course, you know, there's no data for that. So what we typically do is we ask you guys, let's do an NTBNP every year, maybe an echo every year. And at the subtlest findings, consider treatment. But that is a cohort of people at very high risk for problems related to a genetic defect. So, so um, and, and th there's many, many, many of these large kindreds out there now because TTR, as soon as there was a drug for this, TTR mutation testing became very easy and cheap because every drug company, the drug companies will give you boxes to do free testing because they want the diagnosis to be made. So it's very easy to diagnose this. And you have people that aren't yet sick, but, but, sick, but have a bad gene. So gene targeted therapies are appealing. Okay, so um, 
Next question here is any predilection between WOW type versus mutant TTR on phosphate scans? So no, is uh, so when we did that review article, and again, I learned a lot from some of the cardiologists on that group, it seems that the key variable for not missing it, you know, meaning a false negative, is the degree of thickness of the heart and the degree of cardiac involvement. It, you know, and so in general, wild types have a slightly higher average septal diameter than the mutant patients. Uh, but that's a that's a generality. I mean, I've seen mutant mutant TTR patients with a septum of like two centimeters, and some of the wild types are more subtle. So to me, uh, based on the fibrils themselves, I don't believe there's any difference in terms of uptake. It really has a lot to do with how thick the heart is in terms of the ability to make the diagnosis and not miss it. Okay, we have a, a growing list of questions here. I'm okay. trying to keep up. Uh, so next here is what are the mutant alleles that you see uh, in this region? I'm not sure what region, but is there predominance of uh, V122I, yes. V30M, T60, uh, and have you used silencers and stabilizers concomitantly? Yeah, so that's a really excellent question. So the V122I, that's the African-American cardiomyopathy mutation. So that's by far and away the most common mutation that we see. Uh, we see all of them. We see the T60. I have several with it. Uh, some of the mutations are more neuropathy based. And again, those are far more common in Europe than in the US. We don't see a ton of them here. Um, I work with several of our neurologists. I've never found a ton of academic interest in this field in the neurology group. But I believe that that's because the incidence of of FAP, of the neuropathy variants, is very, very low. We have a lot of overlap patients that have both cardiomyopathy and neuropathy, but in those cases, it's really cardiomyopathy that drives the problems. So, so I do partner with neurology, but, but really not yet on any sort of academic uh, efforts. The question of silencers plus stabilizers is an open question. We were asked to participate in a dual uh, therapy trial. I turned it down, and we have instead the AG10 stabilizer trial. I'll tell you, this is my thinking. If you look at these silencers, they take TTR levels down to almost zero. So to me, the idea of stabilizing TTR and knocking it down to almost zero, I find it hard to believe we're gonna get a lot of additive benefit. I think the patients that do poorly with tefaminas don't do poorly because new amyloid forms. I think they do poorly because they have advanced cardiomyopathy at the time of diagnosis, and everybody who has advanced cardiomyopathy, even if you control their hypertension and don't have them anymore, have any more heart attacks, they still, they don't do well. So I'm, I am doubtful that combining hundred plus thousand dollar a year drugs to both knock down the drug to zero and stabilize the tiny remnant of TTR that's left is going to offer any additive benefit, but I am eager to see the results of those trials. All right. So uh, next question here, what is the reason for selective tissue infiltration Tropism of light chain or ATTR amyloid for the heart. So on the ATT, yeah, so on the ATTR side, I don't know other than to say it is a clear tropism because it is based on subtype. You know, in other words, if you have the the, the valine isoleucine mutation, it ends up exclusively in the heart. If you have the MET30 mutation, it ends up exclusively in the nerves. And then there are some that are overlapped. So it certainly, in my mind, has 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 to do with a three-dimensional shape of the misfolded protein. Um, now, why that ultimately leads to a tropism, I can't answer that on any further level. On AL, we do learn more. We're part of a multi-institutional grant where Tufts is the lead center that looks at various light chain subtypes, and in this case, lambda light chain subtypes, based on a retrospective analysis that by, by, by typing the light chains that you can predict organ tropism, and we're now doing this in a prospective manner. So, so we might be able in the hematology clinic in two or three years to have an MGUS patient and say your risk of myeloma is X and your risk of amyloid is Y because you have light chain type blank and allow us to predict the people that are at high risk for amyloid. Jamie, on a practical basis, how many of these patients, suspected patients, need uh, to have a cardiac biopsy? So... So it, the, the short answer is it used to be a high number, and now it's become a much smaller number. Um, the idea would be, so who absolutely needs a cardiac biopsy? Anybody with a monoclonal gammopathy and a TTR mutation, anyone with a monoclonal gammopathy and a positive PYP spec, we can't rely there on subtyping. They have two potential 
precursor proteins, and we need the cardiac biopsy. So those are the slam dunks that are needed. Now, if you ask me how many of those are there, well, let's say three to 5% of all of our patients in these age ranges will have a monoclonal gammopathy. So that's, you know, that's a, that's a large group. So of all A2TR patients, let's say one in 20 may need a cardiac biopsy. Now, of course, if they're too sick, it's a different story. But, but there is a significant minority that still, um, that still do require a biopsy. And I will say, I see another question about, have we seen any homozygous cases? And the answer is yes. We recently saw a homozygous case. Uh, they probably do worse, but what is absolutely clear is genetics counseling for those families is critical because 100% of their children are gonna be heterozygous and be at, at, at very high risk of this. So you can have, I have the, that kindred that's homozygous, that guy has 16 grandchildren, right? And his kids yet haven't been tested. So you can imagine what kind of business our groups can have when we have kindreds like, you know, like that. And a lot, there's a lot of interesting things to study about interventions early in gene positive, but clinically not uh, symptomatic uh, patients. And the carpal tunnel, I see that question, is often bilateral and is often severe. All right. So uh, listen, I'm sure we could go on and on and on. And, uh, you know, maybe we'll, we'll have to have you back another time. Uh, this was really uh, fantastic. I uh, want to thank, thank you. And uh, obviously, I think everyone's antennas are raised. And uh, um, we'll uh, hopefully be seeing some more and better treatments for these patients. Thank okay. you. I want to just thank you for inviting me and just say that the, your entire group, the cardiology group, has always been uh, so eager to collaborate and reach out. And it's one of the things that really uh, uh, make me enjoy managing amyloid here is, is the cardiology group. So I really appreciate it. Great. Thank you, Jamie. Thank you, everyone. Have a nice day. Okay. Thank you.